ES Audio. This is the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. I'm Nick Curtis. I'm Nancy Durrant. And I'm Nick Clark. This is what's coming up on the show. For our first review, it's Next to Normal at the Donmar. That stars Broadway veteran Casey Levy, who originated the role of Elsa in Frozen. There was a time when I flew higher Was a time the wild girl running free would be me now I see It's a musical about mental health and grief in an ordinary American family. And for our second review, it's A Mirror at the Almeida. Stories are the root of all human cooperation, for good or ill. We enjoy telling stories, we enjoy listening to them. Which is why powerful stories have a way of spreading. And, and the faster a story spreads, the more dangerous it can be. That's written by Sam Holcroft and has a star-studded cast, including Johnny Lee Miller, Michael Ward from Empire of Light and Tanya Reynolds from Sex Education. And for our guest this week, it's Olivier-nominated Gabrielle Brooks for Lynn Nottage's Malima's Tale at the Kill. When you're doing theatre as a kid or TV as a child, it's playtime. It just feels like playtime. It's when you get to be an adult that it feels very serious and um, you forget how fun it can be. You'll know Gabrielle from Once on This Island and Get Up Stand Up, where she played Bob Marley's wife, Rita, and did so wonderfully. Welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre podcast. If you are yet to subscribe to this podcast, what? Please do, and then you'll be alerted every Sunday morning when a new episode lands. And it's London Theatre Week 2023 this week. What do we think about that? It's a good thing, isn't it? You can get cheap tickets, can't you? Yeah. Whether it's new shows or you, there's a long run you haven't seen. I mean, Mousetrap's been going for 70 years. You haven't seen it. Maybe now's the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we both quite liked the Mousetrap, yeah, didn't we, we did. when we saw it? Uh, I admit, you know, having... I haven't seen it. Well, now's the time, Nancy. <laughs> no, I know, I know. It's London Theatre Week. It's London Theatre Week. I should do it. I should do it. Do it. Maybe you should. Or, I mean, you should wait until somebody uh, somebody interesting goes into the cast. If they are still casting interesting people in the mousetrap, I'm not really sure. Well, not to denigrate the existing actors. <laughs> well, it was sure excellent. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't prejudge, but let's face it, it wasn't it wasn't renowned for attracting the cream of the crop. The mousetrap was it? In it the did. Past? It did get a revamp though, relatively yes, it recently, it didn't did it? When it hit, what was it? Post-COVID. When it hit 70 years, and they did a you know, yeah, well, post COVID, they spruced it all had, up. They had to yes, painted the corners of the set. Blow the cobwebs off it. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe I will. Maybe so I maybe bloody will. Should, because you know what you'd see there? You'd see the oldest bit of set in the West End. Wow. 50 years... Uh, oh, no, from the original set, from 1952, ah. 53. Right. It is a clock on the mantelpiece, which has been there since Winston Churchill was Prime Minister. Does it still work? That's amazing. Has it ever worked? Excellent question. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's weird that long runners that one hasn't seen. When I um, ascended to this job, I, uh, I made a point <laughs> of trying... Oh! <laughs> uh, which I'd always coveted. I, I made a point of sort of trying to catch all the long runners that I hadn't actually oh. seen. So I went to... Tina, which yeah. I hadn't seen before. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to think what else I caught up. I think I've seen all the long runners now, apart from Magic Mike. Oh, is that does that qualify as does a long runner count? now? It's been going well. I mean, I think anyone anything over five years, sure, oh, right. would be a long runner, wouldn't it? Well, well, but long, it yeah, doesn't but. count the pandemic, though, right? I suppose you've got to exercise those two years or year and a half. But I think it's interesting. Uh, is there a show that you've dodged or that you think you will, you will go to your grave not <laughs> no, <laughs> willfully not quite, seeing? That's quite an interesting question, isn't it? I realised I've never actually seen The Lion King like in real life, mm. um, which I feel like is probably an omission, and I had. I used to work on another newspaper and there was a designer there who went to see that who had seen that I mean she was I guess she was about 27 when I left or something like that and she had seen The Lion King every year since her teens it was like the family Christmas outing and I just sort of wonder whether the depth of that story can really I'm wondering (laughs) when she's going to go and see Hamlet yeah (laughs) which she may have done to be fair but um, I suspect she hasn't been like 24 times or whatever it is. Well, you know, you can get these super fans. There was a, a news story about the woman who saw Les Mis, I think, something north of 900 times. What the hell? Yeah. Uh, that is a real how? thing. That's like, a mad thing. I'm can you imagine to, uh, how much, like, if you thought when you were aged, I don't know, 12 or something, I am going to save 
<laughs> the, yeah. the amount it would cost me to get a ticket on the night yeah. for, what was it, for Les Mis, yeah. every time I even think about going. Mm. Oh, it's a, be, there's an update. She's been, <laughs> she's, been a, she's been 1,027 times. Oh, my well, God. Well, that was in 2016. There is an article in 2016 in The Guardian uh, that says, yeah, I was How, I have seen I think that's, Les Mis. A, I mean, a, I don't want to If anybody sorry. sort of suddenly fell ill, that means she could probably I know, exactly. pound well, onto yeah, the stage. Exactly. And, She'd uh, certainly be able to do the book. Yeah. Sally there's, Frith. Fair play to you. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really she spent more than fifty thousand pounds. I mean, this is in twenty sixteen, so yeah. I mean, she's probably ticked it up a few more times oh, since then. I'm There's completely. Very few by shows that. I'd want to see more than twice. At yeah, the most. I have seen The Lion King <laughs> twice, and the second time Cabaret is an exception, which yeah. I have seen three times. But uh, so just one thousand and twenty-five more times to go. Yeah, one thousand twenty-four <laughs> more times <laughs> I to go. Think I guess. I'm really, I don't think I'm, I'm going to really try and match that record. By that, yeah. I have to say. Anyway, yeah. London Theatre Week. Go out there, <laughs> yeah, get yeah, some cheap tickets. Go to the Lion King. Go to Magic Mike. You know, I don't, I don't know if either of those are actually taking part in it, but I, no, Magic Mike isn't. So Magic Mike don't isn't. Go don't go to Magic Mike. So I can I can continue to miss Magic Mike. <laughs> there was once a lovely Michael Billington review uh, when so I can't remember what the play was that was revived, but he started his review saying, "For those of you who missed it the first time round, congratulations, you can miss it again." <laughs> <laughs> the worst ones are the best they are yeah. indeed yes <laughs> so this week was marked the uh, release of the stage debut nominations um, always an interesting list because obviously they are finding the cream of the new talent not just yeah. the people who have won all the awards in the past so it's always very uh, interesting to look at yeah although well, Lenny Henry is one of them so. yeah, well, that is <laughs> because true because it is but his he first time he's he a first time writer as a writer and he's a first time there writer. are a few starry names uh, obviously yeah. and that would be found in the best West End category because there's a lot of people making their West End debut yeah. yeah, so we have Rose Ailing Ellis this time round yeah. in As You Like It, who was, was wonderful in that. Oh, yeah, uh, gorgeous. Obviously a winner of Strictly. So this is voted for by uh, the readers. So actually, here, it, it is a bit of a pop- popularity. Oh, I do well. feel like, I mean, you know, the, even though Zachary Quinto is up for Best of Enemies, who was fantastic, Samira Wiley for Blues of an Island by the Sky, Mike Feist for Brokeback Mountain, I do kind of feel like the likelihood is that Paul Mezcal for A Streetcar Named Desire is going to do it. He has well, very yeah. ardent fans. Well, yeah. but so, so does Rose. She does. She does. She won does strictly, but, so, yeah. you know, the, the, I feel like the um, teenage to mid-30s female vote, frankly, is probably quite strong <laughs> in, in voting for public, you know, yeah. public awards. And I think he's definitely the one to beat, put it that way. Yeah. Just for his acting talent, right? Just entirely, one hundred percent for his acting talent, <laughs> which is very good. I should also and, stress. Yeah, which is extremely good. Yes, exactly. And so is the vest. It's an interesting looking at this list. Just to be reminded of the stuff of the of the past year, really, yeah. and you know what what fantastic stuff we have seen so far. And a few uh, people we've championed as well. Yeah. Um, and a few former interviewees on this podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're very delighted to see that Operation Mincemeat continues to sweep, you know, <laughs> sweep all before all it. Before it. Yes. Yeah, we um, loved it. And Rob Madge as well, who was, uh, you, you, you both spoke to them. I yeah. yeah. Yeah, they were great for My Sons Are Queer, But What Can You Do, which was just a gorgeous show. Um, and that's for that and Operation Mincemeat are both up for Best Creative West End Debut. As is, interestingly, Michael R. Jackson, who we also spoke mm. to on the podcast, for A Strange Loop, which is at Barbican, which is quite a long distance from the West End, I have to say. One name I'd like to pull out in the Best Performer in a Play category is uh, Bucky Bagrai, who many yes. might know from Rocks, an amazing turn in Rocks, and in the brilliant Sleepover. Yeah, yeah. We, we saw that at the bush, and that was like, she was just brilliant. In and that, that, I mean, that they show, all were. I yeah, they that's were an ensemble cast in some piece. ways. It's a, sh- it's a shame that they picked Bucky Bagrai yeah. out. Um, although she was wonderful in it, mm. but they were all the women in that were, were just absolutely But it probably tremendous. wasn't anyone else's stage debut. But I mean, you know, I thought they were all brilliant and I'm really glad that that show has got some love. Yeah. Anyway. And it reminds you of some of the stuff that sort of started at the, t- at the top of the year that you, we, one has almost forgotten. I'd forgotten that Newsies opened this year. Yes, you know, Disney oh, musical God. like The Troubadour, which mm. was um, actually I thought was, was terrific. I think we got someone else to review it because I was away, but caught up on it later mm. and... Uh, was really surprised to see this uh, Disney musical about labour activism and strikes. It does not compute from the House of Mouse, really. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, I wanted to flag also Rita Bernard Shaw, um, who's up alongside Isabel Tom and Bucky Backray for Best Performer in a Play for Trouble in Butte Town at the Donmark, which I didn't I didn't like the play that much. I mean, we reviewed hmm. it, Nick, didn't we? And um, I was unconvinced, but I thought she was really great. Actually. I agree, I agree. And what a great name, Rita Bernard Shaw. How amazing <laughs> is that? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Theatre in your blood, haven't yeah. you? 
you if you're. She can really choose any other career. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Not going to live determinism. Can we give a shout out as well to Anushka Lucas, who um, oh, yes. for her, yes. she's on there as best uh, for her writing debut, mm. uh, which went down a storm at the Bush. For yes. Elephant, yeah. and is coming back because I missed it. So I'm really oh, looking good. forward. To oh, it. you good, must. Good. Yeah, it's, yeah, so, yeah. it's so good. All in all, a pretty decent list, I'd say. Yeah, it's yep. Not too bad. Well done. Um, <laughs> stage debut. Yes. You have our our, uh, our seal of approval. Our seal of approval. <laughs> <laughs> right. Shall we? Um, shall we get on with the review? Yep. I haven't had a chance to see this yet, but you two have. Yeah, this is Next to Normal at the Doma. It is 2010 uh, musical from Broadway, which won the Pulitzer Prize and three Tony Awards, including Best Original Score. Book and lyrics by Brian Yorkey, music by Tom Kitt. It could be um, subtitled Mental Illness the Musical, I suppose, <laughs> because it is the story of a quote-unquote ordinary suburban housewife and mom um, who is living with bipolar disorder and the impact that that has on her family, um, particularly on her relationship with her, her husband and her daughter. Yeah, it's kind of, it's interesting, isn't it? It's taken 15 years for this to get to the West End. And I know that it's been some kind of labor of love for somebody or other. I'm not sure who. We went to see it together, didn't we, Nick? And, we did. and, and um, you sort of leaned over to me right at the very end as I was leaning over to you and you said, oh, I like the ending. Uh, like, I think that's much better. And, yeah. I, and at the same time, I was saying, God, it's a bit bloody relentless, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, relentless is the word. I mean, there yeah. is a... There's it's 37 a, songs. It's 37 songs and reprises. They're not quite as fast as sort of death metal songs, but almost. Yeah, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> most of them last a couple of minutes. It's pretty much sung through this, apart from a couple of lines of dialogue. Isn't yeah, it? which, There's as just... you know, is a phrase that strikes oh, horror yeah, into my heart. Absolutely. And it comes very much from the Sing Your Heart Out um, school of Broadway performance where, you know, people stand centre stage, fix their eyes on the gods and pour their lungs out into your lap. Relentless is, is absolutely right. It's very, very emotional. It's conducted at a high emotional pitch from start to finish. I wasn't convinced when it started out, but I think what saved it for me was it's it's incredibly professionally produced. Casey oh, Davey is really good. The voices are all... slick as all hell, really isn't it? Yeah, Jamie Parker, I guess we had on the podcast when he did uh, Benjamin Button at oh. Southwark Playhouse plays her husband um, and plays him rather wonderfully. Uh, she sings at one point about how boring he is and he rather wonderfully plays him as really boring. Really boring, <laughs> really boring really and a little well, sort of really, like, boring, really sort really of well. kind but a bit resentful. I really liked that. Yeah, um, it's yeah. like that he was allowed to be that. And uh, the, the daughter is played by Eleanor Worthington Cox who we saw in Secret Life of Bees and prior to that in Jerusalem who has a, an extraordinarily enormous voice given what how sort of physically small she yeah, is. Yes, a tiny um, woman with enormous lungs. Mm, yes. And, and um, incredible voice actually really superb and we have to be wary of spoilers here but there is a fourth character yeah. I mean there, there's five six characters on stage but the fourth character is called Gabe and he is given creepy life oh by Jack God. Wolf um, it's a bit like if Gollum was reborn as a sort of suburban American teen um, it's really quite it's quite distressing it's quite demonic actually. really quite it's distressing really yeah. Just, yeah. just creepy is definitely the word uh, it's, it's, it's beautifully directed uh, by Michael Longhurst mm -hmm. uh, who is sort of on the tail end of his tenure mm. running the, the Don Mar yeah. uh, I'm told this this won't be his last production there but this is obviously you know He's doing this with his legacy in mind, I think, bringing over this very popular Broadway mm. musical. Mm. There's a slightly sort of sitcomish feel to this. Because it's in that set. It's in this sort of, um, uh, I've forgotten the name of the uh, designer. Chloe Lamford. Yeah, and that set is sort of like, it's the kitchen, isn't yeah. it? And, it's like, and it changes occasionally, but it's basically set, you know, it's like, as you say, it's like an American sitcom, which is also like, I don't know, um, Everybody Loves Raymond or something like that. We're exactly, always, yes. more or less always in the same room. And every now and again, there'll be a scene outside the front door or yes. something like that. It's a bit like that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. So I was expecting everybody to hug and learn at the end, you know, and there to be a ni everything to be nicely tied up, and it doesn't do that. Yeah. I won't tell you what it does do, mm -hmm. but it's 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 quite a, a considerably more subtle and challenging ending. Yeah, and realistic that. actually, yeah. a lot more a lot a lot more likely and a lot more realistic than what you might you know than something like say for example the ending of Dear Evan Hansen. Which, mm. And I think there is a lot of comparison to be made between those two shows. I agree. Um, I had this kind of vision of because it took so long to get here, and so obviously it was on and. Broadway and then Dear Evan Hansen opened on Broadway and then Dear Evan Hansen came here and I could just imagine whoever the producer is like the, in New York of, of this show going like damn you you yeah. got my mental health <laughs> musical you know just, and again that's the same thing you talk about that 
it's just the, the relentless emoting mm. and there's never any that was what that's what I really struggled with actually it's just the singing is great and so is the acting but it's just this continuous barrage you sort of yeah. come out feeling like you've been yelled at about depression for two hours which yeah. is kind of you know and it was funny it's and I funny. liked the performance I really you know there was a lot I liked about it but I came out going like oh pfft. Yeah, it's funny, but it's never really right. quiet, is it? That's the no. thing. You know, the, you, the, the song and lyrics get, don't let up. You know, yeah, they're, you they're all at the same moments. pace. And I feel like it would have been more effective and more affecting, actually, crucially, if there had been kind of moments of 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 quiet and quiet comedy, which would allow the emotion to to be a contrast and to hit you harder instead of just sort of like hammering you. Yes. <laughs> Any catchy numbers in there? Yeah. There's one that I've remembered. The rest of it I found completely un. Is that I'm Alive? It's the I'm one you've remembered, yeah. which is the one I'm that's alive. sung by Gabe, which is which is extraordinary. They're, they're sort of rocky. I mean, they're quite peppy and they, you know, they bounce along nicely, but they're not really, they're not really that, that memorable. Um, I you, mean, said, Casey you, you said very rightly in your review that, that the lyrics are very witty and they are. They're very funny. Yeah, they're they really, are. Really, they're really well written, but they're just not mem- not wildly memorable songs. Yes, there's uh, there, there were some lines that I was amazed that there were some words that I never expected expected to hear in lyrics like psychopharmacologist. Yes, <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I do like song, the song then. My Psychopharmacologist uh, and I. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, really yeah. wonderful. I mean, Casey Levy has, a, has an extraordinary singing voice. Yeah. I mean, she sings I Miss the Mountains, which is a, is obviously sort of designed to be one of the sort of big hits from it, one of the big anthems in it. I mean, one thing I did think about this is it's a... This is a, a very strident repost to those who think musicals are just, you know, silly sing-along, happy clappy stuff. I'd say this this sort of knocks spots off Dear Evan Hansen. They do have, oh, share a certain yeah, sort of tonal similarity and a, and a sort of certain, um, you know, the subject matter chimes with each other. But um, this this is by a far more sort of professional and thoughtful approach to the subject. Yeah, I think. and plausible. And, yeah, actually. and actually makes sense. I mean, a lot of Dear Evan Hansen didn't actually make any sense, really. <laughs> It was, a, it was a musical about technology when nobody had a mobile phone. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, I mean, if you love a musical and you yeah. love those kind of Broadway shows, then I think you should mm. definitely go and see it. Because it is, it's just, just, just for the sheer kind of like power of the performances. Right, time for a quick outbreak. Coming up, I caught up with Gabrielle Brooks, who joined me down the line during rehearsals from the Kiln Theatre for her new show, Belima's Tale. We'll be back after these. My name is Eddie Izzard. My name is also Susie Izzard. And you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Well done. Joining me on this week's podcast is Gabrielle Brooks, actress starring in Malima's Tale at the Kiln, written by Lynn Nottage. Welcome, Gabrielle, or Gabby. Yes, uh, thank you for having me. Tell the listeners a little bit about what Malima's Tale is about. What's the story? Yes, I will try and describe it to you without any spoilers, because it's quite magical not knowing too much about it. But Malima's Tale essentially follows Malima, who is a large, beautiful elephant and is one of the last, last big tuskers in Kenya. And you track the tusks and the journey of this gorgeous animal as it passes from each pair of hands till it finally becomes this shiny trinket in um, an extravagant home. But throughout the piece, every individual who essentially leads to Belima's demise and you know eventual objectification which is what often happens to these animals especially when you're taking parts of their bodies in order to you know use as decorations in a human's home they are haunted by the spirit of Malima. it's a pretty haunting tale it's devastating in some ways but also very beautiful in other ways how on earth do you bring an elephant on stage how do you do that I would not like to give too much away, but it is pretty impressive. Ira, who um, who plays Malima, is a, a fantastic theatre maker and um, an actor and dancer, and he yeah. plays uh, Malima uh, himself. It has a very specific dimension, actually, and quite a poignant dimension to have a black actor playing um, an elephant who, you know, is originally yeah. from Kenya. Um, then we get into sort of all sorts of um, themes of sort of like generational trauma and like lineage and history and like what that means for humans but what it means for animals but that is something that remains to be seen and you'll just have to trust me that what we're doing is pretty magical I think that is one of the most magical points of our show it's quite a change this one from the 
last two roles I saw you in. Um, I've just seen you in Once on This Island at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre, which I really enjoyed. And um, before that, um, Get Up Stand Up. So in Get Up Stand Up, you played opposite Arinzi Kenne as uh, Bob Marley. You played his wife. And one of the things I loved about that was that I felt that her character was given equal weight to his. Even though it was a Bob Marley compilation musical, I felt it was very much her story and, and you know, the story of, of, her, of how she coped with this incredibly difficult man. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's hard telling that story, right? Because he is a hero and an icon. And I did wonder yeah. how we were going to continue to be honest, but also honour the legacy of this man. But yeah, it's it's so funny when people say to me that it felt equal because I don't know that um, the story was meant to be that way when it um, was first created. I remember doing one of the workshops and it was very much the story of, of Bob Marley and the ensemble around him that helped to tell his story. I think I was very lucky and the role became um, bigger as I took it on. I was given a lot of agency and I was able to put in quite a few of my ideas, but yeah, I'm very, very lucky that it, it did feel like her story was very much honoured as well as his. You have an amazingly powerful voice. Um, oh, where does you. that come from? Are you from a family of singers or...? Um, am I from a family of singers? Um, thank you. I'm not. My elder sister sings. I had a lot of family in the house, a lot of music in the house, sorry, growing up. But no, I'm not from a family of singers. I sang quite a lot when I was a, a kid and... I did Western shows like growing up, but went to a very like normal school. And then by the time I got to drama school, I kind of thought it was too late to be in musicals because I thought, oh gosh, these people that have been training in musical theatre for many years as a child are way ahead of me. So I actually did an acting course at drama school and thought, well, I'll just be in place forever and ever, amen. I didn't yeah. see myself singing or being a musical. But there have been, I mean, there's, there's quite a number you've been in over the years, haven't you? You've been Hairspray, Wizard of Oz, Book of Mormon. Um, so, yeah, you're doing all right on the musical, yeah. <laughs> the musical side, I think. <laughs> yeah, it has uh, worked out. But, yeah, I, I suppose it's still a shock to me now because, yeah, you just, what you train in is what, at first, what you think you'll end up doing in 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 the industry and I've been very lucky that I've had that variety and I've also made some you know very specific choices because again like I say my dream for my career is yes longevity but also to be afforded the opportunity to continue to have variety so that's why you'll see me do Once on this Island and then a gorgeous play like Millima's Tale because it means that people constantly remember uh, that you don't want to be pigeonholed. <laughs> Yeah. Is there a different challenge to say, I mean, once on this island, you're in, you know, the open air theatre Regents Park, a vast, you know, open space, um, anchoring that show. Here you're very much part of an ensemble in a small, you know, sort of a small contained theatre. Is that a different challenge? Is there a different emotional payoff to, to those two roles? Oh, God, it's massively different. A hundred percent. I mean, Regents Park is a gorgeous, amazing venue, but it comes with its own challenges being outside, right? Like, um, I remember listening to an episode of yours and you were talking about Lacage having their press night rained off. That is just like, <laughs> that is just the, the, the perils and sort of like the wonder of working at that space. Anything could happen and it's amazing. Once on the Sun was like a marathon for me. I never really left the stage. Like vocally, it was very, very challenging and I loved it. It allowed me to like showcase a lot of my ability acting wise as well as um, my vocal ability. It was very, very tough emotionally. Malima's Tales presents a whole other set of challenges. Um, lots of accent work, lots of movement work. Thank goodness we have the wonderful movement director, Shelley Maxwell, teaching me how to move like a man, which is quite a challenge. Yeah, yeah, it's a whole nother set of issues, but it's wonderful. And I do like working as part of an ensemble because uh, yeah. as wonderful it is to be in, be in the front, sometimes it can be uh, like quite isolating. Um, so yeah, it's wonderful to be part of a, a group and to be able to support each other um, through quite a challenging experience. We have to mention that your first acting role was in Grange Hill, no less, uh, when oh, you were, what, 10 or 11 years old, is that right? Oh gosh, that was my first, um, <laughs> that was my first TV role. Yeah, I was uh, in Grange Hill as a child. Again, I was just going to a normal school at the time, so it was really bizarre and amazing. How did it come about? Tell me how you got that part then. Yeah, I, well, basically, as a child I talked too much in school basically uh, I was a very overactive kid and my mum sent me and my sister to drama classes and this drama teacher who had never done this before decided she was going to start a kids agency I think I was seven I was seven at the time I got sent to my first audition she sort of convinced my mum this would be a great idea why not make your child a professional actor my mum didn't know she's from a very normal working class background she has no idea 
And then my first theatre role uh, was a West End job called uh, Whistle Down the Wind. It was an Andrew Lloyd Webber show. And then I continued to do auditions and then eventually got Graham Chill, which was great. It was a great experience. When you're doing theatre as a kid or TV as a child, it's playtime. It just feels like playtime. It's when you get to be an adult that it feels very serious and um, you forget how fun it can be. But yeah, I had a lovely time as a kid. It was great. Yeah, yeah. It looks like, I mean, looking at your your CV, it looks like you've been in pretty sort of constant employment. Have there been times when, when it's been slightly tougher out there or have you basically always worked? Yeah, I mean, I have been very lucky and I have worked quite consistently, I must say. But there have definitely been times... Uh, like any actor where you're out of work you're not sure when the next job will come and to be honest every time you finish a job you think wow is this the last time I will be employed (laughs) will will this be the last time they give me a job but also I've had scary times where I've sort of done it to myself and you know made those decisions and said I you know I really want to try something else I really want to try some TV I really want to try some um, some straight theatre having done you know musicals for four years and you have to just say no and you have to sit very strong in your resolve and you have to um, be confident in that position and sometimes you sort of waver and you get a bit scared but yeah the times where I've been out of work I think I've sort of made that decision for myself and like, very luckily it's paid off um, yeah. bit scary. Whereabouts in London are you from? Um, I'm a North London girl, born and bred. I was um, born in Islington, uh, near um, near Finsbury Park. Sort of between Crouch End and Finsbury Park is where I grew up, which are actually two alien parts of London, if for anyone who spent any time in those areas. A lot of very famous actors actually live in Crouch End, and Finsbury yeah. Park is just very like multicultural and like working class and like gorgeous, and I love it. Um, but I think it's definitely made me the person that I am today, for sure. Gabby, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the Evening Standard Theatre podcast. Thank you very much for having me. That was actor Gabrielle Brooks. Malima's Tale opens on the 14th of September at the Kiln Theatre. After this very short break, we'll be reviewing A Mirror, starring Johnny Lee Miller. See you in just a sec. Hi, I'm Marisha Wallace, and you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Why, come to that, do they put their lives in the hands of other strangers and fight with every sinew to murder other soldiers whom they've also never met? Because... Because they were told a story. Welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Next up, it's A Mirror at the Almeida. I think this is quite hard to describe. So, hey, Nick, how would you like to uh, yeah, give thanks that a, a go? Lot, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the easiest way is to sort of give the setup yeah. and then go from there. Because you walk into a transformed Almeida, which is set up for what seems to be a wedding. Yeah. There are flowers everywhere. Yeah. There's sort Lovely of flower art. drapery. It's, uh, you know, mm-hmm. There's a trestle table with sort of curling sandwiches yeah, on it yeah. over to one side <laughs> and there are uh, seemingly ushers stalking stalking the aisles including Johnny Lee Miller right from the from before yeah, it even right starts yeah. he's, which is great and and you sit down and you're invited into the wedding of these two people but that's not exactly what happened so shortly after we all sit down and Johnny Lee Miller as the celebrant asks is there any legal reason that any anyone knows reason, yeah. <laughs> that these two people should not be married they have a look around and they say, right, there is no one in from the Ministry of Culture. We're going to put on a play. So it's clearly set up as if we're in a totalitarian state. Yeah. And they're trying to put on a show yeah, underground. Yeah, unsanctioned show, unsanctioned show, underground. Yeah. And that's what follows. And so the characters that we thought we were seeing in a wedding are, in fact, the players. Yes. Yeah. And one of them, Adam, is a former soldier, now turned mechanic, who has produced a play uh, which has been submitted to the Ministry of Culture. And he is called in by the bureaucrat played by Chelek, played by Johnny Lee Miller, basically to be told where he's gone wrong. And I think it's fair to say Chelek sees himself as a sort of cultural arbiter um, and sort of kingmaker in a way. So, um, The liberal face of the regime. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, Adam yeah. is played, by the way, by Michael Ward. Yes, yeah. Top yes. Boy's Michael Ward. Any Top Boy fans, he was Jamie and <clears throat> yep. he was excellent. And, and he was in Empire of Dreams yeah, and he Empire was excellent in that. Empire of the Empire of Light. There we go. Empire of Light. Top Boy, don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> this is his stage 
his debut, and he he's a, a wonderful sort of uh, quietly charismatic, but charismatic mm. presence in this. He's a real sort of in sense a very of contain tricky role. To him. Very yeah. tricky role. This is a very tricky play. Yeah. Um, if we're talking about what it's about, it's basically a writer writing about why writers are great. <laughs> See, I'm not sure yeah, it is. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna uh, we're, we're gonna butt heads. On yeah, this we're one, gonna think, argue probably, on this one. But it's basically about how writers exist within a restrictive system. Mm. Uh, you know, a, a totalitarian system yeah. which censors their work. Yeah, and the different ways you can thrive, one of which is sort of underground, isn't it? And with at great danger, and mm. one of which is to sort of play the game of, of censorship. And, and what and, does that do to you as an artist yeah. and to society as a whole? Because yeah. it tends to be sort of propagandist by yeah, nature by, because yeah, it's exactly. been yeah. shaped by the Ministry of Culture. It's sort of like uh, totalitarian fiction 101. They, you know, mm. they, they keep referring to places like Unity Square and all the names are slightly misspelled. So it's add M with an E and mm. things like that. And May is spelled M-E-I. Well, yeah, but um, you say that. But I was thinking about the names, you know, like like May, M-E-I mm. is a name that you see in some Southeast Asian, like it's a Southeast Asian name. Mm. And then um, Chelik. I mean, Chelik yeah. just sat and it's even got the little thingy at the top. Yeah, I don't know yeah. what that's called. But, you know, that's a name that evokes Eastern Europe yeah. to me. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. you know, and Adem, the spelling, it, mm. it's all different. Yes. And so actually all of the names are chosen to separate us in some way or other and to evoke another place. And actually, for me, that doesn't that makes it work less well um, because I didn't at any point feel feel the threat no. that there is meant to be. It's so tricksy, it's really hard well, to explain. But It's also impossible to communicate that threat when you're sat in Leafy Islington. My point is, I think it's a very easy, uh, you know, it didn't really work for me because it, it seems like a very it's a very easy way of you don't have to describe the sort of structure of this or you know, the history of this, uh, this, yeah. this totalitarian state. You just get away with it with a few sort of pointers. You know, it did feel like I'd, I'd seen this a million times before. Talk of propaganda and of, you know, sort of great victories in some war that's been going on. We don't know who they've been at war with. We don't know anything, you know, anything about anything, really. Um, it struck me as sort of deliberately sketchy. Uh, that but that didn't bother up. me at all, because mm. I think I think it uses those tropes to s- sort of sketch that out and then goes into a different discussion. Yeah. I'm not sure we, you know, we don't need to know about the war, but what we need to know is how they're weaponizing it yeah. and how they're using art to weaponize it, because yeah. the um, national playwright is the one who has basically made it up. Yeah. But it's in a purpose of saying what a great and brilliant victory and all our soldiers are heroes. And then Adam has written the truth because he has this skill of which he remembers everything that anyone says to him and he writes everything completely verbatim. So it's, yes. yeah. uh, he, it's called a mirror and in some ways as the playwright he is reflecting back on on the ministry, on the, um, you know, on the censorship. And the playwright, Sam Holcroft, has been in North Korea. She's been in yes. Syria and Libya. She's spoken to people. One of the things in the play is it's a discussion about authenticity mm. and about how much reality we can bear. There's a lovely line in it about which of your lives would stand this level of scrutiny. The idea of, you know, if any of our lives would up on stage mm. in all their stark, unedited glory. Um, yes, thank you be... to our producer, Rachel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it would be, yes, indeed. Um, it would be unbearable yeah. to us and to, you know, to probably to the people watching. Um, I, I didn't have any any question with how well written this yeah, was. I, I, think it's, it's, I think it's a splendid, mind-bending piece of work. I think my... Issue with it is I found it extremely indulgent. I just do not like it when writers write about how great writers are. And no. this is one of those – this is a complex and difficult area because, I mean, I revere writers mm. and, you know, I, I'm a theatre critic. This is what, you know, I go for the live performance but I go for the writing. You know, they create these worlds. They are the ones who do it. But I hate it when they when they aggrandise themselves in this way. But the thing about this one, though, I feel like especially having – you know, having read a bit around it and sort of mm. the way that she, Sam Holcroft, has talked about it. In fact, I sort of feel like it's not self-aggrandizing. I feel mm. like it's more of a tribute yes. to writers who are in those positions. We are not. You know, one of the things she said, she said in an interview, you know, all I risk is a bruised ego. Yes. You know, they risk... A, a bruised face or worse you know interview, and it's yes. like they I'm sure often would just say look it's it's what I do I can't you know and and I have to do it in this situation but but actually like the the sheer immense courage that those people show just to make art day in day out in yeah. a place that that is scrutinizing you all the time and you could slip up without even realizing it is I think that's kind of incredible and so I feel like this play is more of a tribute 
Uh, it looks mm. more outwards than it looks inwards. I agree. I, I, I agree with you about that. But I still think there's something there's something sort of innately interior about this play. It's a play about writing and about. Um, Perceptions of reality, and it's very meta theatrical. I mean, the, the way the way that the framing device keeps sort yes. of coming back in, mm. and more levels of but plays within plays okay. get added into yeah. it. Malievich, Malievich made paintings about painting. Yeah. I, yeah, I know, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 know I know, I <laughs> know. At one stage, there is a. I agree. There yeah, is Shakespeare a play, wrote a play within a play. Well, yeah, 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 what's and, and there is a play within a play within a play at one yes. stage. So, yeah, it is really playing with it, but you you then have to. You know, this is what it's about. So then you have to see, well, is it well done or is it badly done? Yeah. And I think it's brilliantly done. We, we haven't mentioned Tanya Reynolds. She was in a sitcom called I Hate You. And she brings a lot of that sort of kind of goofy sort of or oh, line readings. I can't read properly and yeah. I'm a bit gawky and a bit, uh, you know, mm. all, all of that. But the character is sort of by the end is filled with pathos and, and, and uh, hugely empathetic, I think. Yeah, yeah. But the person who holds it all together is Johnny Lee Miller. I could not stop watching him. I thought no, he was. You can't take your eyes off him. He's this sort of malevolent presence that stalks around. He's got these black leather gloves and yes. this shaved head. It's, it's creepy sort of, as hell. Quite skeletal. Yeah. And then he, he so he goes from sort of all these different roles and and he's sort of twitchy and it's it's almost like as the censor he mm. is embodied. It's like he's trying to break out from his sort mm. of constrictions himself. He's twitchy and uh, I just think his role, his, his performance is. is he's sort of de- he's sort of deformed by fantasies of power and by sexual desire, isn't he? You know, there's. But also trying to be a good, thinking he's a good cultural yes. sort of uh, you know uh, he's keeping culture alive. He's keeping what? the flame alive. Yeah. He's sort of tending it and shaping it, isn't he? That's his view. Well, yeah. And, and yeah. but it was an interesting audience that you think because like uh, th- this was on press night mm. as well but you know but there's an undercurrent throughout as you alluded to Nick in, in certain scenes where you questioned the sort of sexual motives as one of the characters mm. and the audience was really quite vocal in its distrust mm. of him in those moments I found that quite striking you know whenever he kind of said anything that might might possibly be a sort of slight come on to May mm. you would just everyone, there was somebody somewhere going like ooh <laughs> yes, <laughs> it was really, yeah. I really liked it it was quite it was it was it was really good Clark you were saying to me earlier about you know again the complacency of British audiences I mm. think in the sort of like our, our not necessarily British audiences but just like our complacency and that we're like that happens elsewhere it yeah. doesn't happen it doesn't happen here and it hasn't happened here but it just really struck me um this morning when we were talking about it about you know they the shakespeare is banned in this in this yeah. unnamed mm. totalitarian state and schools in florida are only using excerpts from shakespeare to avoid raunchiness you know and you just kind of go like oh that's that's think- not that's not quite far enough away. <laughs> as I was writing, I was thinking you know, there's something. I felt a certain complacency, as, you, as mm. to use your word, in writing about totalitarianism from a f- relatively free society. Mm. But then yeah. I was thinking, but we are having, you know, the right to protest. Curtail. Of course, yeah. we are. And, that's know, true. Are, that's you know, true. There is a, a, a liberalism abroad at the moment. So. And while it's not as extreme as what it. we'll experience or audiences will experience in this play, and what they seek to. You know, evoke. I agree with you. I hate things that are self indulgent and about writing about writing, plays about plays. But actually, I didn't worry about it. And taking it on its own terms, I thought the writing was great. I thought the acting was great. Mm. And it left me just with these sort of mind bogglingly interesting things that sort of have kept me really going over in my brain about all these subjects, actually. Mm. Mm. And so it, when we talked about would we recommend it, I think you'd have to caveat it to people you recommended it to about exactly what it is, that it is this meta-theatrical text mm. <laughs> that'll put off <laughs> quite a few people. <laughs> but if if you are willing to take it on its own terms, I just think it's an extraordinary piece of work. I also don't think that, I mean, I wouldn't caveat it like that, I have to say. One of the things I wondered was, is it too good a night out? Because <laughs> it is really fun as mm. well as being incredibly thoughtful and all mm. of these things. But um uh, but I don't think I would caveat it like that. And, I, and you know, and I, I just think when something's performances are like this, yeah. I, I do think it's worth seeing. And I don't think anyone will be bored. No. So I would recommend it as a night at the theatre <laughs> because, in fact, a lot of people will be a lot less used to and you know, seeing yeah. plays about plays and writers writing about writing. Well, yes, you know, so they'll find it a lot bit. less annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Yeah, it's quite, laughs> anyway, that's it for uh, this week's Evening Standard Theatre podcast. Check out all our other episodes below, which include interviews with the likes of Frankie Bridge, Danny Mays, Lenny Henry and Caitlin Fitzgerald. And you can find all our latest reviews at standard.co.uk. That's linked below. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast so you never miss us. Thanks to our producer, Rachel Abbott, and we'll see you next Sunday.